So, Michael, let's let's get started. Um, now, you own your own coffee shop, right? Yes. Uh, what it's a, it? Well, it's it's more than just a shop, too. It's a roastery. So we actually uh, uh, roast, produce, bag, and uh, ship our coffee all over the country. Okay. Now, you roast yours a little bit differently, correct? We do. So what we do is a process called fluid bed roasting, which... Uh, fluid bed is uh, kind of the best way to think about it is a hot air column and uh, typical roasting is done in a drum and drum roasting will use natural gas, uh, basically a direct flame right on the barrel. And what happens is uh, you're getting both convection and conduction heat that uh, is heating up your beans without getting, you know, too sciencey and technical with it. Uh, air roasting is kind of think of it like a giant popcorn machine. Um, it's all convection heat. So the beans don't right. touch each other long enough or they don't touch the, the roasting apparatus long enough to conduct heat. So because it's all done through that, you get a much cleaner um, output of air. You also get no VOCs. So uh, with the uh, volatile organic compounds, which in drum roasting, they can't get them out of the drum because they have to build the heat up. So what happens is you get some of those VOCs uh, and it does affect the flavor of your coffee. So what I hear most is that our coffee, people use the term cleaner, if you will, um, smoother, uh, less acidic. It's just a, uh, I just think it's a nicer taste. I, how to explain to you, you know how when you go to a good steak and you can taste like two, three, four different flavors in your steak? Yeah. That's the, more the way I would describe your coffee because Southern whiskey, you know, I've ordered it from yeah. you guys. So that's one of our flavored ones. Yeah. I would more describe it to, to like going to a high end restaurant with a chef where you can taste like different flavors of flavor. Yes. Which you don't well, get I, in other coffees. Yeah. Some, so what people don't get is the longer you roast the coffee bean, the more you taste the roast, less of the bean if that makes sense. So like when you get into an Italian roast coffee or French roast, something really, really dark, you're getting more of the roast flavors than you're getting the actual bean. For example, I'm drinking uh, a blonde roast right now. It's a two bean blend. It's called the Blonde Bomber. It's a coffee that I came up with a couple months back. And uh, it's, it's super complex. I mean, you get all these, just so many different layers of flavors. Um, you know, and this, the aroma of it is really unique too. It almost has a peanut aroma to it. Um, part of the reason is you're not, uh, blonde roast is an incorrect term. It's actually called a cinnamon roast in the actual roast levels. And what happens is uh, typically when a bean cracks, it's when the interior and the exterior of the bean reach the same temperature and the water inside the bean basically boils off and it causes the bean to crack and expand. So what happens is we pull the bean before that happens. Um, and then of course we use two different, uh, beans in our blend. So you just get this really, uh, uh, just pure coffee flavor that I really like. Some people don't like blonde roasts. Uh, I do. Uh, they have a natural sweetness cause you're not really caramelizing the sugars in the roasting process. So you can just get this really nice, really sweet, uh, coffee. How often does it happen that you have to scrap a batch and just cause you overdid it? Uh, not a lot. So the cool thing about our roasting process, it's very manual. So it's not like you don't get the drum roasters, you set it in a computer and you walk away. Um, our stuff is very manually driven. You have to constantly adjust the air column throughout the roast. So unless you're not paying attention, which, you know, once in a while I've been doing something and I have to walk away from the roaster and then you, you overdo your batch, but not many. And luckily we do small, small batch. So we do 10 pound roasts. Um, so in reality, if I'm doing a 155 pound bag, that's 15 roasts for me, you know, 16, if you count the, the warm up, And then, uh, if I mess up one, that's only 10 pounds, you know what I mean? So, so, so the first roast you, you just use as a warm up or, uh, well, I, I, I do a smaller batch. Typically what I'll do is uh five pounds. Um, and then that allows the machine to, uh, get up to temperature before I do a bigger load, like a 10 pound load. Um, 
So that's like what you bring home to your family. <laughs> don't, don't no, no, no. It's still t- the taste is actually the same. Oh, okay. uh, with fl- with fluid bed roasting, what's a little different also is the amount of time that it takes to do your roast is also is part of the profile flavor profile. So what happens is if I start the machine with a ten pound roast, it's not going to roast it in the time I need to get the right flavor. So by using a five pound roast, it allows the machine to come up to temperature, but also roast that five pounds within the window that I need to get it in. So if you're going to recommend to someone that was just getting into good coffee, what home setup would you recommend to them? I mean, I always tell people like, I'm not a big machine person, unless you're getting like an espresso machine, it's a little different. Um, But for like, you know, I would say a French press or a pour over setup. Um, I think it's really nice because you can adjust your grind. You can adjust your coffee uh, amount, your ratios. Uh, we, re- we recommend like a one to 12 ratio, give or take. So for example, a 20 ounce French press for us, we use uh, an ounce and a half of coffee. Um, but I would say you should get a small digital scale so you can properly weigh your coffee out. You should get a water boiler, you know, a good water boiler. And then you want to get a... Uh, you know, either a French press or a pour over or both, you know, there's, there's a difference between the two. Um, they're going to give you a different type of, of coffee. Yeah. I use, I use a pour over currently and I use the electric kettles. Like you more, you more see this in Eastern Europe or Europe, you know, that's I just, what I'm talking got, about. Yeah. The electric water boilers. Yeah. That's what that, that's what they should use here. They're actually better overseas. Uh, they're a little bit more like they have scales, like in their kitchen people that's normal. Um, here in the U S it's like, no one has a scale in their kitchen. It's like crazy to me. Well, it's, it's funny because when I bought my, my, it's called a Chinook in Ukraine, but when I bought my electric kettle, you know, we're still staying with my friends and I offered to make, you know, them a cup of, cup of tea, which, you know, I broke this and I was, I broke it out and I was, she was like, Oh, what's that? And I explained it, explained to her, keep in mind, keep in mind, she's in her sixties. You like her and her and her husband. Yeah. Yeah. That's the tea and kettle. Then, That's the old school stovetop tea kettle generation. And then the next, oh, they microwave it. And oh God, that's terrible. Yes, yes, you know. And I just ordered some good tea also from Amazon, you know, some good European tea. And they're used to Lipton's and stuff like that. And long story short, you know, I was like, she was like, oh, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. I'm like, used to tea kettle. She's like, oh no, I'm afraid of it. I'm like, there's one button. It's a pretty it's easy on. thing to use. I've I've got a pretty I've got a pretty beast uh, beast one in my kitchen. It's uh, I used it at the old uh, cigar shop I had, and uh, it does uh, water from a standstill to boil in less than two minutes. It's crazy. I I bought an espresso machine here. And I made the mistake that I, it was too cheap, and it's just yeah. it's it's better not to use it because I had a good one in Ukraine, like the one you showed me in your kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. You know, mine was, you get, what you, you get what you pay for with that stuff. Well, I think a lot of people don't realize it. it's the metal I'm trying to think what you call it. The piece that you attach to the coffee machine and get it to drip the type of metal that thing's made out of holds and determines the heat that the, of the grinds, you know, the water, the grinds is going to get a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. So the one for, you know, from Walmart, it sits in there for decoration. Oh yeah. Because it yeah, ruins we- the, it ruins a cup of coffee every time I've used it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my thing is it's better to, I mean, espresso is obviously based on pressure and, uh, and heat and everything. So it's like if you're not going to do, uh, do it the right way, it's better to not do the espresso at all. Just stick with a French press or something. I've got a great, oh, you know what I got to show you? Hold on. Go I don't ahead. know if I can I'm gonna grab it from the kitchen. I got this new French press. It's great. It's, uh, from, the, it's from London. And I'm the first person in the U.S. Turn a light on here. I'm the first person in the U.S. to get one of these. Um, and uh, we're going to carry them in our shop. We're going to be like their importer. But uh, let me see if I can set this up. So this is dirty. Don't mind the French press being dirty because I used it this morning and I haven't cleaned it. Oh, no. I wish there was a way to turn the camera around. Is there? Hold on. Oh, yeah, there is. All right, check this out. So this is called the Dagono French press. Okay. It's a D E G O N O. And what it is, which is cool, you'll notice I have coffee in here. So hold on. As I bring it up, 
notice how it's got a double seal. Yeah. And you can see the coffee grounds are trapped like in the middle. So what's cool is that's got this button, right? So you can release it and you pull the top seal. See? Yeah. So what happens is you put the bottom seal in, you put your coffee grinds in, right? You put your water in, then you take the top seal and you sandwich it down. And then the nice thing is when you lock it, when I pull this out, it pulls the coffee grinds out and it like squeegees the glass, right? So already like look how clean that glass is. Nice. So the other thing is that last, you always get that little bit of water that sits or the little bit of coffee that sits in the bottom yeah. of your grinds. It squeezes that out. So you actually get that extra, you can see it in the bottom. You get that extra, you don't lose that, that last couple ounces. And then when I'm done, I'm not going to do it now because I'll make a mess. But if I take that out, it holds everything in that little cake. And then you take it over to the trash can, pop the button. It just drops the cake into the trash can and you're, you're clean. So you basically don't end up with, um, there we go. You don't end up with, uh, with a mess. Now, is there a advantage to, no, I've never used a French press. Is there an advantage to it? Yeah, there is. Uh, French press is uh, direct immersion from the coffee in the water, right? Okay. So you get, uh, get a lot of extraction. Um, pour over, if think about it this way. You get coffee, you pour over, the water is like running past the coffee. And it's kind okay. of grabbing oils and, you know, extracting what it can based on temperature from the grinds. Within a, with a French press, it's the water is got the grinds just sitting in it. So it's it's possible one would be better for one type of coffee and one would be better for a different. Yes. Thing. You pour different flavors. So yeah, that's why I said you kind of want both because French press gives you a very oily coffee. It gives you that you get that foam. Um, kind of head on it when you make it. And then a pour over, it, it's called the coffee bloom, which is like the oil. Yeah. Traps that in the filter. So with a pour over, you get a silkier, kind of smoother cup of coffee. Ah, uh, okay. Now, do you know how much you're going to be charging for that? Uh, so I want to say they're going to be 30, I think they're $37. I think it's $36.99 for that okay. French press. Um, we're still working on importing. I think we got 18 of them coming over from the UK, they're going to be on our website, palehorsecoffee.com. Um, you know, we're going to sell them in store as well. Our stores in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. Can you set one aside? Of course for you, I'll do that. All right. So now you've been overseas a lot. What, yeah. what was your, what was your favorite place overseas? Oh man, that's so hard. Oh, uh, yeah. man. When you say that, it's like all these memories start coming back. I'd have to say, man, like, I mean, we talked before, you know, I love Eastern Europe. I spent a lot of time in Latvia. Um, it was just a great place, man. And I think what, I guess if you look at it, when you rate a place, you got to think like the place itself, right? And then you think of the people and the culture. Like Latvia was not an amazing place, like location wise. Um, right. But the people were awesome like i just made so many friends out there and just had such a good time um you know we we did drive over to lithuania um which is pretty cool one of the little beach towns and uh had a little uh weekend trip there that was fun i mean it was just a it was a pretty countryside it's just uh you know like madagascar for example like i went to madagascar that place is like mad it's magical like it's you know i looked outside my my hut I lit, like stayed in an actual hut and you know, there's no windows and I slept under a mosquito net, but the room, it was a beautiful, beautiful place. Well, that's like, there was a volcano, like this giant, amazing volcano right out in the water, like a little Island. And it was like at my feet and I'm looking at it going, this is like something out of a move. This is crazy. <laughs> well, my version of that would be Crimea. I stayed in what's called old town. And you know where they get the big bricks, they're sand bricks, like the old yeah. fashioned. So yep. it's like you're walking down the street and it feels like you're in some old movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And I, yeah, I, think, like, Eastern, I think Eastern Europe gets a bad reputation. I mean, the people are really friendly and people's like, oh, absolutely. So unfriendly there. I'm like, no, it's, it's there. It's that it's, they have a dry kind of way about them I think you know like it's just they're not it's not like the typical 
you know, American. You to learn to read them. Yes. But everybody was so friendly. And I had, I, like I said, I made so many friends. I went to like 35 different countries. I mean, speaking of Madagascar, that on the wall is actually a shield from Madagascar. <laughs> nice. Hanging out. But, uh, you know, I, I, I had so much fun traveling. And it's like, you know, I went to Africa, I, you know, Morocco, Nigeria, Sierra Leone. See, I've like, never seen any of those. So many places, man. And it's like, you know, I'll tell you, when it comes to like, scenery outdoors africa is unbelievable like absolutely unbelievable i went to a small island called sao tome it's right off the equator i can't i can't even describe like the nature and just the beauty of this place like it was unbelievable driving around and it's so untouched because they don't overdevelop they don't tear everything down so you just see these like cocoa forests you know just magnificent trees that are thousands of years old and it's less it's like something you'd see in like a in like a painting and you're like this is real it's wild volcanic beaches black sand beaches like just crazy man it's crazy now when you when you when did you go to litva in lithuania uh, i was uh let's first see. time i mean well 05 to 08 is when i worked as an instructor for the military where i was doing like state department stuff uh part of the foreign military sales training package so i was traveling all over um that was 05 to 08 i want to say probably 06 and 06. i went you just cut out you're there then you're gone okay sorry yeah I, somebody called my phone and it like oh okay so interrupted got, in my headset we got where you said you were as an instructor and then poof the state ah, department. Yeah, so not for, so I was in the Coast Guard and I was doing uh, foreign military sales, um, international training. So basically, like sell, you know, part of the FMS package they call it. You sell like a boat or whatever to uh, foreign, uh, you know, country. Friendly. We would go over and train them. Sure, whatever. Um, <laughs> <laughs> over and, and train them. Uh, and it was weird how it worked because they wouldn't like buy a boat from us. We would give them like we would give them like a hundred million dollars, and then they would turn around and like give us back the hundred million dollars for the boats. It's weird how it works, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's like that'd be like me saying like here, here's money, and then you're like okay, and then you take that money and you buy coffee with it, and I'm like technically I'm just giving you coffee. But you we remember can't who? You remember who I said so, David's godfather is? So yeah, I, I get it. Uh. <laughs> so. So anyway, we, we, uh, we did that, but it was, it was cool. Um, you know, cause like I said, I went to probably three, I think I was there three times. Um, I was in Ventspils and I was in, uh, Leopie. I went over in 2008 and I don't know if, if your experience was the same as mine, but like when I first got there, like Ukraine was not, especially like it wasn't Kiev, but when I got to Kharkov, that city was not used to seeing foreigners. And I get people like, can I take a yeah. picture with you? And then a lot of people are like, would you please sit down and, and, you know, have a cup of coffee with me? And they just wanted to talk to me because it was the first v time Vence they got Bills, to sit with a foreigner. Yeah, Ventspils and Leopi were like that. They were very small. Like, if you go to Riga, I mean, there's British people all, they go to Riga to party, like, on the weekends. There's a lot of nightclubs there. Like, Riga, Latvia was like being in, like, New York City. It was crazy. It's a huge city, big buildings, you know, tons of foreigners. There was like French people walking around. I mean, you could hear it was very melting pot there. Um, and I guess they said like that's the uh, spot where a lot of British uh, See, young guys go for their uh, bachelor parties and stuff to party because it's cheap to fly there. Well, see, there was a lot of Africans and Arabians, but like to see an American or or British oh, yeah. person that's well, no, unheard so of. Yeah, Leopi was like that, and Ventspils, because even that, you wouldn't even see foreign people. It was, one of them was a, a logging town, so it was like Lumberjack town, basically. And when they, when we got there, they told us, they're like, you are the only Americans in the city. Well, it was, it was so, kind of, <laughs> that was like, it. <laughs> my friend Dima would walk around the city with me, and he, he spoke English exceptionally well for like a 17, 18 year old guy. And, yeah. uh, we would be walking around and he he was like how do you just walk up to a group group of girls because you're always walking up to the prettiest one and you're like hey can you help me do you speak english you know and he's like 
if I try to go up to the same girls and he won't talk to me, I'm like, it's because it's the first time they're meeting a foreigner. <laughs> and he, he couldn't, he couldn't understand that, you know, it, to be honest with you, going from Hollywood, California, like the amount of doors is automatically closed because guys hit them all the time moving to you. Oh, of course. It was a completely different thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't just girls. I mean, guys, you know, I, 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 I ran across this guy. I was waiting for my girlfriend to come out and he was concerned because as outside in the cold and as a foreigner and as in a village, he was trying to forcefully take me to his house because he was concerned that, you know, oh, really? I, I, I could be in danger. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it was yeah, hard to explain did. to him, you know, like I live in Hawthorne, California. I'm okay. Yeah. 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 They don't know what that's like. I had a, a pretty cool kind of experience like that in uh, Uruguay. We were, we were in Argentina. We took a ferry over to Uruguay and we, we rented these, uh, well, I had this genius idea of renting this, it was like a go-kart basically. It was like an off-road dune buggy type thing, you know, and uh, you could ride it in the street, you know, there. So I was like, oh, it'd be so cool. Let's get a dune buggy and ride it around. Well, it's, it was freezing there. It was like really cold. And uh, I had no windshield, you know, I had, no, and of course we just dressed in light jackets cause we were planning on just walking around downtown. So then I got us the stupid go-kart thing and we, uh, we were driving around the countryside and it, it was just cool. It was like an adventure, but it was freezing. And uh, my head was so cold. My hands were like frozen on the steering wheel. And we ended up going to this like lighthouse and there was a farm next door. And the woman, she saw me like, you know, I was like blowing into my hands and she ended up coming out and, and gave me a hat and gloves that were like handmade from like some, I don't even know what kind of fur it is. It's like some animal, obviously, but you could see they were like hand sewn and they're, and I still have them to this day. Like I've had them for, you know, God, it's like probably 14 <laughs> years now. And I still wear them in the winter. They're great. People go, Oh, that's a beautiful hat. I'm like, yeah, I got it in Uruguay from some farmer. <laughs> Isn't it weird how people in, lower income situations seem to be more thoughtful. I mean, when you go to those countries and stuff, they're always concerned, like, you know, do you have what you need? Yeah. 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 But it's, you know, it's a different, different mindset there, you know, different mentality. Well, I think it's because they've, they've had to overcome so much. So much. Even in America, oh, yeah. we're kind of spoiled. Oh, absolutely. People, even, even people here that, don't think they have it good. Don't realize how good they have it till you go to some of these other countries. They just don't, they don't get it. It's, it's sad to see how many people in this country don't actually leave the country. You know what I mean? Like they just don't. My, my own siblings that way is like, I'll never get a passport. I'll never leave America. It's like, are you kidding? So many what? foreigners are so jealous of us because our <sighs> passports can get us almost into any country and we can travel yeah. freely, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's some foreigners that don't want to live in America. They just want our passport so they can travel easier, you know? I know. Yeah, Europe was cool, though, like being able to drive around just, you know, place to place and cross borders and get, you know, get your passport stamped. Going now, you do jujitsu, cool. don't you? No, 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 no. No, I, I was a – so I was a DJ on the radio and uh, got into podcasting. And I had a comedic podcast with another DJ. and we shut it down and then decided to get into uh not i wouldn't it wasn't commentary by any means but we basically were doing like a talk show for a local uh mm professional and amateur mma league um so we had a uh i guess like an mma podcast if you will and we okay. interviewed all the fighters and stuff like that so i mean i i've been in martial arts i've trained in martial arts not jujitsu particularly like brazilian style um, I did some of the traditional Japanese jiu-jitsu. It was very, very different. Um, I did uh, Jigen Ryu, sword, um, taekwondo, aikido, stuff like that. But well, if you've done Japanese jiu-jitsu, if you want, I have an open invitation to the Sachi aikido seminars. That's oh, okay. international. And Sagal nice. goes there sometimes. Wow. Um, before everything happened over in Ukraine, I became the only foreign member of, oh, let me think of which name it was, the Crimean, the Ukrainian Crimean International Keto Federation. 
Okay. But when I was down And I did there, that stuff, God, like 20, 30 years ago when I did that stuff. <laughs> it's been forever. I'll be honest with you. Some, some of the best things about it wasn't learning the Aikido. When I, when I go down to Crimea for the big seminars, it was the people from the different countries. I mean, yeah. you get to know, because you have to switch teams, you know, like you're, you're, each sensei brings 10 people. Okay. And long story short, like you, you get thrown in a different groups and you get to talk to people. And there's some people that's from Serbia, some people from, you know, Belgium, some people from Russia and you yeah. get talking and it's, it's kind of a, that was the coolest thing for me about the seminars. That's crazy. That's a lot. I, I, uh, it's, I think most of the time I've known you when I met you, were you in the U S or did you, had you moved overseas yet? That's when you and I are both in ton. I can't remember if remember, you were is that is that video Greg. game Castle Age. We we're, we're both yeah, in the that's Were you were you in the Ukraine yet then or no? I can't. It's 2008. I was in Ukraine. I can't remember. I don't remember what year it was. It was a while ago. No, but, uh, it, it was it was it was it was funny because like I remember when I added you as a friend because we were in the same group he was like, "What do you think, sweetheart?" or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny. It's like, you're the only, like, I obviously play a lot of like games online and stuff. And it's, you're the only person I ever met like in a game and actually became friends with them like in real life. And I thought it was crazy when Ukraine was going through all that, that violence and, and oh, stuff and God. you were there. And it was just like, when you're in the U S and you hear about stuff like that overseas, you're very removed from it, you know? Well, and then Ahead, I messaged you like, dude, are you okay? <laughs> like, this is crazy. And then you were giving me like firsthand accounts of stuff that was going on. And it was funny because I would be at the cigar shop and I would talk to people and I would go, uh, yeah, you know, like in Ukraine, they'd, like someone would bring it up from the news and I'd be like, actually, what's really going on? And they'd be like, how do you know? And I'm like, my boy's there <laughs> and he's American. <laughs> so I was like, I got the inside scoop. That was, a, for one thing, it's, it's a good thing as a, I'm sort of a prepper, you know, yeah. and it's not, People call nowadays they call it prepper, but when I was growing up and I grew up in the back country, rule is if you don't have a month worth of supplies in your pantry, you're poor. Yeah. Well, that's called being so, prepared. You know, so and then when I seen Victoria Newland handing out cookies in Kiev, I was like, Oh dear God. You know, and I looked at David's mother's like, You're gonna have a civil war. And she's like, How do you know? It's like that's Robert Kagan's wife. And she just looked at me and she was you're just a conspiracy theorist. Well, okay. a month and a half later, her mom came up to me. She's like, how did you know? <laughs> because I read every book that these advisors put out. So yes, I recognize the signs like, Oh yeah. You know, and they thought she was making fun of me because I went and I, I, I stocked up. I bought like, I seriously had four months worth of supplies in my pantry at that point in time. Yeah. That was a good thing. You did that. Be, yeah, because her family's coming and, and getting stuff off of me. You know, it was, it was just kind of funny. It wasn't a sh there wasn't there's was a very short period of a shortage, but yeah. okay. For people who don't understand, an average citizen at that time was making between three and two thousand grivnas a month. Okay. okay, so it's it was eight grivnas per dollar per U.S. Now, dollar. It's, the worst week or two, it went, it fell to 32 grivnas per dollar. And then it bounced, it kept bouncing between 26 and 28, just back and forth, back and forth. Okay. Well, a bag of sugar that was six grivnos is now between 30 and 40 grivnos, depending wow. on which store you go into. That's and crazy. So I had all this stuff that I bought very cheaply. And it was funny when you see that because like the factory owners and stuff came out. It's like, we're going to give you a thousand Grivna race, like six months into this, a year into this. Okay. So they were making $375. If you're making 3000 and they dropped down to $115. So yeah. with this raise, now they're making $150, but the factory is still selling everything for the price of dollar. So it's like wow. the owners are shoving all this money in their pocket. Of course. And that's something people, I, I think more people need to understand how that works. With Corruption is not uh, unique to this country, so. <laughs> no, but it's, it's like everyone is crying for an all-out revolution and to crash the government. Like, there is a huge cost to it, and it takes a long time to rebuild. Absolutely. And you think that the people that, that take over next are going to be any better? It's human nature. 
just people are fucking. I'm sorry, I'm all over the curse, but no, is, I don't care. <laughs> people are just. It's corruption's human nature, man, and it's like you know, like I tell people, they go like, "Oh yeah, it's disband the police," and I'm like, "You think that's a good idea?" Like, I got you know a question I mean? for you. Those same guys that are throwing bricks and stuff into like businesses, and the police are stopping them from going into houses and stuff. What's going to happen when the police aren't there? You see, and I, I've lived in that situation. I mean, it's like our, our city yeah. wasn't as bad as some of the other cities. Well, it's your, you're at that point, you're required to now protect yourself. And I don't think a lot of people are ready for that. Um, and then on top of that, you know, there's a lot scarier people out there than the police. So, you got. So worry I'll about. mention the name Azoff. That's like when Azoff hit our city. And I mentioned to David's godfather. It's like, you know, hey, Azoff is in our city. I just seen him in the metro. Or subway. Mm -hmm. He's like, if I was you, I'd get out of that city if you're there. And I went and I got David's mother, you know, from work and brought her home, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't I forced her out of work. It was just, you know, I escorted her home when she was done. And people of course. don't realize what it's like when you, you know, they have no idea what it's like when, when things like that happen. Yeah. Yeah. My uh, really good friend was in, um, Oh, what the hell country was that? They had a revolt, like, while he was – they actually cooed while he was there, and he got stuck in the hotel with the president, the deposed president. And uh, it actually turned out to be – like, nothing, like they ended up standing down eventually. There was no uh, major bloodshed or anything. But it was cool because he actually said he got to, like, sit with this dude at the bar in the hotel and, like, drink with him and stuff. And he's like – this is the guy that's, like, getting overthrown, you know? Like, this, my buddy's, like, hanging out with him having a drink at the bar with them. <laughs> it's like they couldn't go anywhere. They were trapped in the hotel. The military had them, you know, obviously protected, but surrounded in the hotel. So it's just crazy. But you, you, you hear stories about like some of these countries and the, the stuff that goes on, the genocide and things like that. It's like, and, and what's and weird is like, you can see out on Twitter, like some of these paid contractors bragging about it, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like Michael Skillet out on his Twitter account bragging about sniping people. It's like, really? And Twitter's allowing yeah. us up on there. there. I'm just trying to make coffee, man. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Just make my coffee. So, hey, what about, uh, what about this little thing? I hear you have a cigar coming out. Well, we, we've had it, actually. Um, so I owned uh, Primo Cigars, which was just my little coffee and cigar shop. That's how I got into Pale Horse Coffee. So, like, odd enough. I was the first uh, commercial account for them that like restaurant or whatever that was using their coffee right. and then became very good friends with Don, the owner and his wife, Penny. And uh, eventually when they moved to this area, they offered me a partnership uh, with the company. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm a hundred percent down. So of course I helped them after that and became their roaster and started working with them. We picked up another partner. So there's actually three of us right now. Um, but uh, before I came on as a partner, I wanted to make my own cigar. That was already in the cards for me. You know, and most people who have a shop have what they call a house stick. So eventually you become friends with these factories and these cigar companies. And, you know, they say, hey, you want, you want your own stick? You want a house stick? And it's good to have one. So I said, sure. So I started working with a blender from Enki and Origin Cigars. His name's Corel Martinez. He's an amazing, amazing guy, man. Master blender. He's like third generation Cuban uh in the tobacco business and uh his cigar was actually the first cigar i ever carried as a vendor and uh he uh asked me if i wanted a stick so i said yeah and i gave him kind of what i was looking for so i worked on the blend with him so you just kind of uh, tell me your favorite sticks that you like well, and what what characteristics you like out of them more or less the kind of, starting point it was, it was, it was actually more in depth than that. I mean, I, I, I'm a tobacconist. I'm pretty well versed in tobacco. So I really got into the binder filler and wrapper. And as far as like what particular leaves I wanted to use, um, you know, and then he went over some different blends and some ideas with me and, you know, we, we settled on what is now the pale horse cigar. Um, I needed a name for it. So back then I thought it would be cool to call it pale horse after the coffee company. And my, uh, at the time, um, uh, I had just gotten involved with Pale Horse. My partners were like, yeah, do, do it up. And we were selling it in Primo as our house blend. And then, of course, after COVID, 
uh, when Primo closed, um, obviously decided not to reopen it. And, uh, you know, we were still expanding Pale Horse. I told my partners, I said, look, this cigar is a top sell. I mean, I showed them the numbers. It was the, in the top three uh, sold cigars in my shop every single month. Most of the time, because people come in, especially people from out of town, they can get Davidoff, Perdomo, you know, Oliva. They can get that stuff anywhere. But right. when they come in, they're like, hey, you have your own stick. I want to try that. So it generated a lot, a little bit more interest. And uh, they, uh, they decided to bring it into the company. So we actually brought it officially under Pale Horse. So there's a company in uh, uh, Miami that does cigar bands like the band that wraps around the cigar. So right. we decided to get a band made. So that's being done right now as we speak. Um, the, uh, the artist that did it, Mike Cranford from North Carolina, is a good buddy of mine, awesome artist. He did this incredible drawing of the, uh, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse uh, with the band. It looks really, really cool. So, Don't you have a coffee neat, similar to that with, with that band? No, no. So, well, we use the Reaper. I mean, you can... See on here, this is a, our Reaper is, a, you know, death, obviously. Death rides the pale horse, and that's pale horse coffee. So our slogan is when you feel like death. So we, we have a lot of, you know, our logo is a skull holding a, a coffee cup, and, you know, a lot of our stuff is themed like that. So so how long until you guys start selling it on your on your website? Uh, pretty quick, actually. Um, I want the band. So we're getting, I want to see 16 bundles of cigars in any day. Like we're just waiting on the shipment to come in. I just set the humidor up at the shop the other day. Um, I'm waiting to see if we want to launch it on the website without the bands. Um, we probably will. The next shipment of cigars will have the bands on them. And that, okay. to me, that's important because if you have an unbanded cigar, you put it in your humidor and then you forget what it is. You know what I mean? And if, you know, if you're out somewhere and someone goes, what is that? If you don't have the band to give them, they're not going to remember. Well, it's also like a so, business card. You know what I mean? Just yeah. on, on anything, yeah. you, you need your label there. Of course. So well, it also shows, it also, sh to me, uh, as a, uh, you know, a cigar lover, to me, it's like, you take the time to put a band on a cigar it shows me that you're serious about your brand because you spent the money, you know, anybody can go out and buy, you could, you could contact a cigar factory and go, I need a blend. What do you have left over? Make me a cigar and they'll do it. But right. to get a band, you have to go to a place, get the band, get the dyes, pay for all that setup fees, then have the band sent to the factory over and wherever you're getting the cigar made and have it applied. That's a lot more of a process. So basically you guys are going to turn the coffee shop and, sort of a coffee cigar lounge where if you're outside yeah. no so we definitely aren't going to do that and part of the reason is cigars are very niche coffee is not um mm -hmm. a lot of you know let's say younger especially millennial you know and gen xers and stuff they're not going to want they don't want to sit in a smoky you know smoky place so we're not going to allow smoking inside the shop we're not going to have like a cigar I'm more lounge. for outside like if you're outside um well, we don't, we don't have a outdoor patio. So what we're okay. actually doing, I don't know. Oh, I'm sure you saw the pictures, but the trolley? I had a, uh, the trolley. Yeah. I'm a so huge fan the, of the trolley. I'm sorry, but yeah. I really like that. trolley. Oh no, I am too. I took me a whole year to build that damn thing. So I took a historic Rhode Island public transportation trolley, had it shipped in, uh, towed down from Rhode Island and we gutted it and we turned it into a, uh, cigar lounge full ventilation lights, LED lights, furniture. We kept half the original bench seating. There's a little man. Say hi, Dave. Hi. Hey, bud. So watch cartoons. <laughs> so. so yeah, so we, we're gonna probably tow that over to Pale Horse uh, since it is no longer being used at Primo since we closed. And uh, that will allow people to come, kind of go in there privately, enjoy the cigars and coffee, and they don't have to worry about bugging you know, non-smokers, which is cool. Give me a second. I'm just trying to make sure things go, don't get knocked over. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I kind of joke with people. I always say like, look, as much as you probably don't like cigar smoke, non-smokers, cigar smokers don't want you around. <laughs> like most people who smoke cigars want to be left alone. It's kind I, of a chill, I think kind of a chill thing. 
I'll be honest with you. Like that was one thing I missed hugely when I was over in Ukraine was a cigar lounge. Cause in Hollywood, I, I hung at Mark Jackson's cigar lounge all the time. Okay. I mean like these are D um, from ER was constantly in there and he, he's a cool cat. He is as, yeah. as, as a person, he doesn't act all egotistical like a lot of actors do. Um, yeah. Ricardo Smalls who played Biggie Smalls on Mad TV you know, he, he had a joke. He's like, I drink so much vodka. He goes, he goes, he goes, I've got to be a Russian by now. Yeah. You know, it was just so many different people. There's a different culture. Like when you're sitting in a cigar lounge, like, I don't know about yours, but at Mark's, everyone had to shake a hand and Mark really introduced yeah. me to it and took me through the etiquette and started, you know, smalls, yeah. too. smalls, you know, cause well, I didn't know cigars anything are... about cigars and they, they really took me into the, you know, the lines yeah. of it. Well, we always say cigars are like the great equalizer. And a good example, you go to a restaurant, right? And you get a guy who's in a, a work vest that's working on the street for the city. And, and he comes in to grab lunch, right? And you get a bunch of lawyers from a law office and they're sitting there eating dinner. He's not just going to sit with a random group and be like, mind if I have dinner with you guys, right? Like, that'd be weird. Um, but with cigars, it would be very common for them to say, hey, come over and sit with us. We'll be smoking. And what I found is that like, I mean, literally the owner of the professional hockey team in the city here will sit down with like, you know, Navy guys and sit down with like, you know, bartenders and, and whoever. I mean, like we have executives from the huge uh, uh, commercial real estate company, like locally, um, they come over and sit down and it's like everybody just chills, like any race, any color, any sex. We have women, we have men, we have, you know, Asian, black, white, Hispanic, Latina, like whatever, you name it. it everybody chills and smokes. And it seems to be something that is like a common ground that is, uh, you know, we always say brother of the leaf or sister of the leaf. And it's like, there's no bounds to that. You know what I no, mean? Absolutely. And, and I, that's, that's what I experienced there too. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's cool about a cigar lounge. Like you never know. I, I, I'm going to say I'm going to miss owning a shop for the simple fact that you never know who you're going to meet. Like, no. And it opens a lot of doors. Like for, for example, like I was working at guitar center, you know, I've been, now I got smalls. that will get me to the comedy club for free. You know, when he's, yeah. when he's hosting or, um, ice tea, I think it was ice tea. He, he was playing over at the house of blues. Mark, Mark asked me, he's like, would you like to come over with me? I would have never had those opportunities, you know, it's just like, yeah. I got to go to house of blues. That's the only white boy up in the VIP room. Of course. <laughs> you know? Well, what's crazy. I mean, obviously in Hollywood, you're going to get even more of a, uh, of a, uh, what is it called? You know, celebrities. I mean, like I'm in Norfolk, Virginia, obviously we're not going <laughs> to, Yeah, but most, you know of, I mean? most of the celebrities, they, they really didn't act like you, what you would expect from celebrities. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, Mike Tyson was, I think that was a great example. He came in and until he get bombarded, I felt bad for him. The poor guy had so many people rushing in for photos. He couldn't yeah. get a piece, but like moments when there wasn't much traffic on Hollywood Boulevard, he'd sit there and talk with everyone. Yeah. You know, and I, I think That's that awesome. poor guy gets a bad rep. I mean, he, he's a yeah. good dude. He really is. But, uh, <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, I'm going to get off here because just like you, I've got a little one and I made him a few promises. But definitely, I'm, I'm my, shout, shout I'm out. sleeping right now. Plug, so. <laughs> plug, your, plug your coffee shop. Yeah. Your general location. Um, so uh, Pale Horse Coffee. Uh, you can see I got my, my lid on. But uh, palehorsecoffee.com, anywhere in the country, doesn't matter where you are. If you're listening, you get to uh, go online. You can order. We have shirts and apparel, coffee mugs, you name it. We do all the swag. Um, you know, all the coffee shipped right to your door. There's no minimums or anything. Um, if you're in the Chesapeake, Virginia area, we're at 1296 Battlefield Boulevard South, um, Suite 104. You can't miss it. And uh, we're actually taking over the space next door and going to be expanding. And we have a second shop opening later this year in Greenbrier, uh, Chesapeake area. So, you know, just get on Google, look us up, come on out to the shop. Uh, we do a full latte menu, you know, espressos, Americanos, uh, coffee of the day. We have 18 different flavored coffees, 10 different bean origins from different countries. I mean, you name it, Ethiopian Yerga Chef. We have Tanzanian pea berry. We've got, you know, Kenyan, Panamanian. It's like a little bit of everything. So. And my favorite, Southern Whiskey. 
Southern whiskey is one of our 18 flavors yet. So what we do is we use a Central American bean and we uh, both natural and some artificial flavors, obviously. Uh, but we do flavor each bag individually, pound by pound. So it's, uh, like I said, a small batch. And uh, I, a lot I of love goes got, into that coffee. So I got I actually got Keith Allen from Bleeding in Stereo, their lead singer. I got him drunk okay. right now. Nice. Heck yeah. He came, you know, he's over at the house and he, he came from awesome. Jacksonville, Florida to visit his parents. So he always stops in and sees me. And, yeah, you know, I, I introduced it to him. And cool. So anyways, Mike, it's appreciated. great. And everyone check out Michael's online store. And if you're in the Chesapeake area, stop in and say hi to Mike. Yeah, and when you come, when you come down to visit, uh, like we talked about, you have to bring some of your books down too. Yes, sir. I will. Excellent. You have a great day, Mike. All right, brother. Thank you. It was good, good talking to you. All right. Bye. bye. All right. Bye.